I appreciate each one of you. I'm so thankful for you, and I love each one of you. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to continue to teach the class and for your support and encouragement. I very much enjoy the subject matters that we have been talking about. kind of want to tell you where we're heading in our next session, kind of show you where we are right now. What we tried to show in our first quarter, and that I hope our workbook was able to demonstrate, is that the Bible has been reliably transmitted to us. Now, a person may or may not believe that the Bible is God's Word, but you can at least have confidence in the text. And I think that we did a good job, or we tried to the best of our ability to do a good job, of showing that somebody who says, well, the Bible has been corrupted by man over time, and you just can't have any confidence in the text, there's just no evidence for that. No solid evidence for that at all. And then, I hope I've been able to impress on you the fact that people gave their lives that we might literally gave their lives, that we might have good English translations of the Bible. You know, early on, the church was strongly opposed to people having the Bible in the common tongue that they could understand. And people would be put to death for translating any part of the Bible into the common vernacular, into common English. Now we just take it for granted. Uh, you know, you can have 70 translations of the Bible on your smartphone. You know, we just take it for granted but there was a time when that was not the case, and we need to be aware of the sacrifices that people made. And then I tried to show you uh, through some of the studies that we had that there has to be a designer in the universe, that, that design, complex, functional design demands a designer. And again, a person may or may not accept the God of the Bible as being that designer, but there has to be a designer somewhere. <laughs> And uh, now I know we have some folks in here for the first time, so some of what I'm gonna say is gonna be completely unfamiliar to them. But just to refresh everybody's memory, if you believe in an old earth, an old universe that's billions of years old, I don't, but if you happen to believe that, just be aware, and I'm running out of room here to write, that uh, that would be one in 10 to the 16th seconds. So if you accept an old universe, that's how many seconds there would be in the old universe, right? Now, we took a look at what it would take to get one functional protein molecule by random chance. Remember, protein molecules are made out of amino acids. There are 20 amino acids. First amino acid, that's one in 20. Second amino acid, that's 20 times 20. That's 400. Times 20 is 8,000. Times 20 is 160,000 times 20 is 3.2 million, times 20 is 64 million. And remember, for a short protein molecule, we have to do that 150 times. And so the chance of getting a one functional protein molecule just by random chance is one in 10 to the 174th. Uh, that's one with 174 zeros. Now, are you gonna get even one of them by chance, one functional, not, not even one functional protein <coughs> molecule, and in your cells, you have an average of a million, one million different protein molecules per cell on average in your body. For fun, I took a look to see how many protein molecules pond scum has in it, blue-green algae, <laughs> pond scum. And even the simplest blue-green algae has a dozen different protein molecules. You wouldn't even get pond scum by accident. So anybody who says to you that it happened by chance, random chance, over a long period of time, just has not looked at the facts and figures. It just, you know, Darwin didn't know anything about this. There was no molecular biology in Darwin's day. And so we may have an opportunity to go back to some of this later on, but we're gonna kind of leave that for right now because I just wanted to show you that there does have to be a designer in this universe. And now what we're gonna do in the next part of our study is I'm gonna show you to the best of my ability that the God of the Bible is the God of the universe and that the Bible is his revelation. So we're going to be taking a look more specifically at prophecies in the Bible to make that point. So we may have an opportunity, I hope we'll have an opportunity to go back later on to some of this, but we're going to kind of leave that part and we're going to be moving into Bible prophecy. So much that I need to show you. 
and I tell you, I get frustrated because I can't cover everything that I want to. Uh, but before we leave that and move into more of our study this morning, I just want to tease you a little bit, if I may. So, for example, I spent all this time talking about these protein molecules because I thought that'll be new to most folks. Most folks haven't studied that. That'll be new. You don't usually get that in any kind of Bible class, that kind of thing. So I didn't even really talk about DNA and genetics and all of that. Uh, but I do want to tease y'all a little bit and hope that we can get to this sometime. Y'all know, probably most folks here, if you've had high school biology at all, know that inside of the nucleus of each of your cells, you have chromosomes. Everybody's heard that before. Inside the nucleus of virtually all of our cells, we have chromosomes. Chromosomes are made up of twisted molecules of DNA. Isn't that cute? I like that. Anyway, so it's made up of twisted molecules of DNA. And DNA is made of four bases. Do y'all see that there are four colors there? Blue and red and purple and yellow. And, and those are the four bases that are arranged in a linear order and those bases make your genes that determine things like your hair color and whether you're right and left-handed and how tall you're gonna be and those kinds of things. So inside of each of your cells, you have 23 pairs of chromosomes, 23 pairs of chromosomes. They're made of twisted strands of DNA and it all is coded with a four letter alphabet, all right? Now, whenever you see writing on the board, I gotta tell y'all, believe it or not, I walked in this morning and this was magically on the board. <laughs> <laughs> what are y'all laughing at? You think I'm making that up? You're right, I am making that up. No, nobody thinks that. When you see any sort of a language or any sort of a code or any drawing, what, what do you automatically know? Did you, you know somewhere there was a writer, a designer, or something. You know that. The human genome, the thing that makes you human, consists of 3.7 billion, 3.7 billion characters made up of a four-letter alphabet that are all arranged in exactly the right order. 3.7 billion characters using a four-letter alphabet, all in exactly the right order. Uh, Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, who I would think would know a little bit about coding, looked at that and he said, it's like a computer code. He said, but far more sophisticated than anything that Microsoft ever thought about doing. Now, we know that a computer code has got a coder somewhere behind it. When you see this, what do you know? Well, I mean, what do you have to know? <laughs> what do you have to know? Is there any way that you would get a code like that by accident over time? May I show y'all something? Again, I'm just teasing you a little bit this morning. I have to show you something that's one of my prized possessions here. Ladies, this is an entire set of chromosomes from a lady, from a woman. And you can't even see it, all right? There are 46 chromosomes on that slide, and I can't even see it with my naked eye. I have to put it under my microscope at 400 power just to barely see it. All of this, 3.7 billion characters right here and you have to look under there to see it and you think that happened by chance who thinks that I mean no, seriously think about it just a little bit I wish I had time to let everybody look at it and see it under my coat and maybe later on we'll be able to do that we don't have time this morning I just wanted to tease you a little bit and to let you know that I haven't begun to scratch the surface of the evidence that God gave us that there is a God, that there is a designer, that that could not happen by accident. So just something for you to think about. You know, the Bible says all of this a lot easier than I've been saying it. Would y'all take a look, please, at Hebrews 3 and verse 4? I think one of the marks of the inspiration of Scripture. 
is that it will say something really important in very few words, and it will say it in a way that everybody can understand. Look at Hebrews 3 and verse 4. Every house is built by someone. You see a house, and you know somebody built it, don't you? You know, the bricks didn't arrange themselves. The sheetrock didn't float themselves. The boards weren't nailed together on their own. Somebody put the tiles on the roof, all of that. Every <coughs> house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now, that's how long it took the Bible to say what we've been talking about. Now, just something for you to think about. And the reason why this is so important is that if you don't accept that, if you don't study that, if you don't believe that, if you deny God in your thinking, if you start going down the evolutionary pathway, it leads to some terrible, terrible consequences. Because then we start thinking that man is just a higher evolved animal. And then we start reaching some conclusions that you're not going to be comfortable with. I want to see if I can show you that just a little bit. I want y'all to take a look at this word up here, these two words, Otavanga. Raise your hand if you know what that means. Anybody know what that means? No, Robin, you have already told me. Told you. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody know what that means? I can tell you why you don't know what that means. Because your history teachers aren't going to teach you what that means. <clears throat> After Darwin wrote The Origin of the Species, and the idea started becoming more common that perhaps we are simply evolved from lower life forms, then the thought came along that different groups of people in different parts of the world are at different stages in evolution. Y'all see where this is going? And so, for example, people who live in one country are not as evolved as Brother Evans living in San Antonio, Texas. And then I start looking down on folks who look different than I do, have a different skin color, have a different background, and I deny that that person was made in the image of God. And it leads to some horrible, horrible things. Now, you're probably not going to get this in history class, but after Darwin came along, then the idea of social Darwinism began to increase. Social Darwinism is the idea that different groups of people are at different stages in evolutionary development. And that means some people are more valuable than other people are. And it leads to Otabanga. Otabanga was an African pygmy. <clears throat> who was bought by slave traders around the year 1900 and brought to America eventually. He was, again, an African pygmy. He was 4 foot 11 inches tall. If you have your smartphone, by the way, you could be typing that in, taking a picture, uh, look at his, at his photograph. And believe it or not, eventually, Otabanga was displayed in a zoo, in a cage. The Bronx Zoo. New York in America for people to look at. Now, if I just told you that this morning, you'd think I'm making it up. So I want you to be typing that into your smartphone if you get a chance. And this would have been 1906 that he was put into the, got a, got a picture of him there, Bill? World's Fair. Yeah, and he started, that's where he started, was in the World's Fair. Eventually, he was in the World's Fair. Yeah. And they put him in a cage with an orangutan. Anybody ever study this in history? No. no, no. And some people started saying, you know, I'm not sure that's right to do that. And the New York Times wrote an editorial on it. And I think, Austin, do you have that? Austin, do you have that, the New York Times? Or do you, where uh, story, we don't know why there's so much emotional. Have you gone down? It's like it's uh, kind of, it's, it's over halfway down through the Wikipedia article. It's kind of set in from the margins there. Sort of. And, yeah. And it'll say, we don't know why. Uh, I don't have that part. All right. Can you get down there to it? Keep looking down. It's kind of toward the bottom of the article. And somebody will look it up for me here in just a second. And, and what's your view of the New York Times right now? Real conservative? 
ultra conservative. No, no. It's just, <laughs> okay. So, so again, this is from the editorial. Can you guys hear Austin? Austin, read this slowly and loudly. And I want you to realize this is the New York Times, 1906, not science fiction, in the United States of America. I'm going to have to read it once, and then I'm going to have to read it again. This is Okabanga being put in a cage in America because we start thinking folks are of different value. Read from it, please, Austin. We do not quite understand all the emotion which others are expressing in the matter. It is absurd to make moan over the imagined humiliation and degradation Benga is suffering. The pygmies are very low in the human scale, and the suggestion Ooh, start. That, Read that back over again, that part. Uh, the pygmies are very low in the human scale. What does Genesis 1, 26 and 27 say? We're made in whose image? God. Which one of us? All of us. All of us. Go ahead. And the suggestion that Benga should be in a school instead of a cage ignores the high probability that school would be a place from which he could draw no advantage whatever. The idea that men are all much alike, except as they have had or lacked opportunities for getting an education out of books is now far out of date. Wow. Did y'all hear that? Wow. <laughs> Incredible. My guess is you weren't taught that in history class. So. And you would not have guessed that, would you? All right. That's the modern eugenics movement that was strong in America in the first half of the 20th century. It's what drove Hitler in Europe. Is that where you're going, Lynn, in, in your thinking as well? We aim for a master race, and some races just aren't as evolved, evolved as the rest of us are. I'm not gonna be taught this from about Darwin. Darwin was very racist in his views. He also had a very dim view of women. He said women were evolved halfway between children and men. Now my guess is you're not gonna read that about Darwin either. But you can read it in his book, The Descent of Man. Everybody's heard of The Origin of the Species. His other book is The Descent of Man. So I want you to see why it's important what we're studying and why the Bible view is so important. And you wonder, how did we ever get, I mean, Austin, to me, that was almost unbelievable. When I, I mean, that, that doesn't, that's not even registering in my mind. You know, I thought somebody made that up. It's hard to read out loud. It's hard, yes, that's why I had you read it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's hard to read out loud because you don't even like those words to cross your lips, right? Does that make the impression on y'all? And why what we're studying is important? And why what the Bible says? God says we're made in his image. All of us are made. There's neither Jew nor free. There's neither male nor female. We're all one in Christ. That's why this is so very, very important. So I, I hope I hope that's of some help to you. And then I also just wanted, if you enjoy watching YouTube videos and that sort of thing, don't know if you're familiar with John C. Lennox. John C. Lennox is, a, yeah, you're, you're familiar with him? He's oh, really good Yes. his debates and everything. Yes, okay, I'm glad that we have a, a, an affirmation of that. Uh, he is a smart fella. He's Professor Emeritus of Mathematics at Oxford University. He's nobody's fool. Professor Emeritus of Mathematics at Oxford University in England. And he identifies as a Christian. And he has debated the most militant atheist in the world. Uh, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens. He has debated them. And the reason why I think he's so valuable is he has a unique ability to keep a calm, sweet demeanor even in the midst of a really hard debate. He keeps a perpetual smile on his face and has good humor even when he's talking about the most difficult subjects. I've learned a lot just by watching the way he conducts himself in a debate. And so, you know, if you like, like watching YouTube videos, just type in John C. Lennox and Richard Dawkins and watch their debate on atheism and creationism. He wrote a book, and this is it's a short book, it's a quick book to read called Can Science Explain Everything? And he shows the limits of science. Uh, I'm, I, I, I think we all agree that science is valuable, but he wrote this book called Can Science Explain Everything that you might find valuable. Does anybody have a thought, a comment, or a question on the Otabana <coughs> thing or the John C. Lennox or anything we've talked about? Yes, Todd? So 
I, I just went blank on the name, but in one of your classes, you talked about the African American man that did so much for the peanut agriculture. Yeah, George Washington Carver. Yeah, and how he basically started and self-educated himself. Yes. And I mean, he's obviously of African American descent. Right. And would probably be the smartest person in the room if he were here yes. today. And so that makes it all the more sad when you see, of course, hopefully as a society, we've realized that we can't, you know, judge a person by their ethnicity, but by what they do and, and how they act. But that really struck me uh, as, you know, someone who made a, a huge impact on where he lived, whereas he could have been bitter yes. and thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back to Africa and I'm yeah. going to do this because yeah. these people, what the, how my people. Appreciate it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. That's a good point. And I really appreciated Todd last week. Uh, giving us that summation of the of the hormones and uh, you know how difficult you know I thought you gave a really good illustration that helps us understand there is a designer and the designer said in the Bible that we are all created in the image of God and if somebody says well has uh, you know has racism ever been a problem in America <laughs> just remember that remember those words if you don't mind that Austin read for us this morning. <coughs> My guess is you probably have never studied that in history, but when I did, it was kind of an eye-opening experience for me. Right. Yes, one of the tragic things I just read in this uh, Wikipedia article about yes. Otabanga is that he committed suicide That's in, right. in 1960. Yes, when World War One had started, he realized he would never be able to get back to his home country. He would never get back to the Congo because World War One was going on. And he built a ceremonial fire. He had his teeth all sharp, and he knocked the caps off of all of his teeth, borrowed a pistol, and shot himself in the heart. Mm -hmm. And died at 33 or 34. They're not sure of his right. exact age. Right. Yeah. 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 All right. Okay. But yes, Liam? John, I think the Proverbs 3 5. Go ahead. And my, my point is, is when man leans on his own understanding yes. and doesn't look to God, yes. there are severe consequences. Mm -hmm whether it's Odebenga, whether it's the Nazis, or if you look at current day, yes. what we're seeing happen, there's such consequences, and we just don't seem to get that sometimes. Yes, and, and we're in a, a cultural war. There's no doubt about it. Now, it's not the kind of war where we take up arms and that sort of thing, <laughs> but it is a spiritual war that we're engaged in, and it's why our study, I think, is so important and so valuable for us. All right, so we're going to switch gears now, and again, I hope I was able to tease you just a little bit here. And uh, you're welcome after class to come up and take a look at the slide with the chromosomes and all that kind of thing. But I want to talk to you this morning because we're about to finish our study in our workbook on different translations of the Bible. And this morning what I want us to do for a few minutes is compare the Revised Standard Version and the New American Standard Bible. Now this is kind of important. Uh, I want you to notice it's not the New American Standard Version. It's called the New American Standard Bible. And that is different than the New American Bible. Now, this is important to get in mind because the New American Bible is a Catholic translation. So somebody one time, they said, John, you told me to buy a New American Standard. And I bought it and look at it. It's entirely different. And then I looked and what they bought was a New American Bible, not a New American Standard Bible. So that's important to keep in mind. And I want us to compare and contrast these two. And the reason why is they illustrate two different approaches to translation. The Revised Standard Version was the first version that used what the scholars called dynamic equivalence, right? Instead of the New American Standard Bible. Now, in the New American Standard Bible, the translators believe that not just the thoughts of the authors were inspired, but that the words they used to express those thoughts were inspired as well. So they believe that their responsibility was to translate those Greek and, and Hebrew words into the nearest English equivalents that they could. So they said, we're going to try to stick with the words as best we can because we think not just the idea is inspired, but the words themselves were inspired. In the Revised Standard Version, 
the translators took a different approach and they said, well, we're gonna try to make it easier for folks to read. And so what we're gonna do is just, we think the thoughts, the ideas that are being expressed, those are inspired, but not necessarily the words themselves. And do you see how you can begin to drift from the truth? Or at least it's easier for the translator's ideas to begin to drift into the translation uh, under those circumstances. And folks say, well, John, help, help us understand that a little bit. Where dynamic equivalence, complete equivalence, that doesn't make any sense. Tell us what you mean. So let's say, for example, that in the Hebrew, you know Hebrew is a real concrete language. And let's say the Hebrew said that uh, King Jehoiakim was hard of heart. King Jehoiakim <laughs> was hard of heart. We don't talk that way, but let's say that's what it said. King Jehoiakim was hard of heart. So uh, the King James, the old King James would say, King Jehoiakim was hard of heart. <laughs> and then the New American Standard would want to update the language a little bit, but it would want to keep the same wording as much as possible. So the New American Standard might say, King Jehoiakim was hard-hearted, all right? So it would keep the language, just make it a little easier to understand. But the Revised Standard Version would say, well, no, let's figure out what heart of heart means and put that into English. And so it might say King uh, Jehoiakim was stubborn, all right? And you say, well, that, that makes the same sense. But do you see how I start to make room for my own <laughs> ideas to be interjected into the translation? I think what most people want is a Bible that renders the wording into English without commentary from the translator. <laughs> they, just want, they just want to know what the words say and uh, keep your opinions to yourself kind of thing. But the Revised Standard took a less certain pathway. And I want to see if I can show that to you. So take a look, if y'all would please, at uh, Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Isaiah 7, 14. And then I want you to look at Matthew 1, 22 and 23. Isaiah 7, 14. Isaiah 7, 14. And Matthew 1, 22 and 23. All right. And I tell you what, we're going to start with Matthew 1, 22 and 23. And, and since we got Matt here and we're in Matthew, how about we get Matt here in just a second? So Matt, would you mind reading Matthew 1, 22 and, and 23 for me, please? And, and by the way, what do you have to be reading from? Oh, okay. All right. If you're going to say revised standard, I was going <laughs> to switch people. <laughs> yeah. uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophets. Let's see, where was that? 21 and 23. Uh, 22 through 23. Yeah. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means... God with us. Okay. So so read the last part again there about the virgin part. Yes, sir. Behold, the virgin shall be a child and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. All right. And, and is everybody's Bible pretty much in agreement there on that? Does it all look pretty consistent with whatever translation <coughs> you happen to be reading from? And, and then, Matt, does it have a footnote telling you what verse is being quoted from there? Yes, sir. Is it Isaiah 7 and verse 14? Okay, so now I'll look back at Isaiah 7 and verse 14. And let's see, Connie, I think you're reading from the old King James. Would you mind reading Isaiah 7 and verse 14 for me? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. All right, and, and so that's very consistent, okay? So... So we're quoting from the Old Testament, Isaiah 7 and verse 14, and everybody's fine with that. That makes sense. That's what we're accustomed to hearing. But I want you to hear the Revised Standard. So the Revised Standard will have basically the same thing in Matthew 1, 22 and 23, the virgin, you know, shall give birth. But I want you to listen to Isaiah 7, 14 in the Revised Standard. So here's the verse it's supposed to be quoting. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign Behold, a young woman shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. So it says young woman, <laughs> not virgin. Right? So you put Matthew in the awkward position 
of quoting an Old Testament verse to prove the virgin birth that doesn't say virgin birth in the Old Testament. So it says virgin birth in Matthew, but in their bystander, it doesn't say that back in Isaiah 7 and verse 14. And you begin to see other instances like that in the Revised Standard Version. Now, I want to emphasize that you can learn the truth from studying the Revised Standard Version. I'm not telling you that you should never use it or look at it or read it or anything like that. All I'm encouraging us to do is to realize that there is a difference among translations and that you do need to exercise some caution and some care. So, may I go ahead and give you just one or two more verses that you might take a look at. Turn now to Romans 11 and verse 20. So now we're turning in our study to Romans 11 and verse 20. And again, Matt, you've got the New American Standard. Would you mind reading that for me, please? Romans 11 and verse 20. Yes, sir. Uh, Romans 11 and verse 20 says, Quite right, they are broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith, and not be conceited, but fear. So you stand by your faith. No, nobody has a problem with that verse. Everybody here would agree with that verse, no problem. But may I read that verse to you in the Revised Standard Version <laughs> and see if you don't detect a little difference here in what it says. Right? That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast only through faith. So do not become proud, but stand in awe. Do you see the difference? Everybody here would agree that we stand by faith, but there is a difference between standing through faith and faith only. Now, how are they able to insert? And by the way, in the original language, there's, there's no word there for only. How did they decide to put that in there? Because they said, well, we think we know what it means, and we're going to put it in what we think it means. But you see, they didn't really stick with the language there. And so uh, you begin to see, you begin to detect a difference among translations then. Anybody have a thought or a comment just on those, those points that we talked about? I'm going to give you one more example, if I may in just a moment. Let me give you a verse that is hard to deal with. Nobody doubts that this is a hard verse. Take a look at Psalm 51. So the 51st Psalm. And I want you to come down to verse 5. So this is going to be Psalm 51 and we're going to read in verse 5. Right? And this <clears throat> depends a little bit on which Revised Standard, I'm gonna, uh, this is the Revised Standard, but I'm going to read this to you from the New Revised Standard in just a moment. Somebody read that verse for me. And again, go ahead and read that for me, Matt. Psalm 51 and verse 5. Yes, sir. Uh, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Okay, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Now that might mean several different things. It might mean I was born in a sinful time. It might mean my mom was sinful. It might mean I was sinful. If that's the only verse we had, we might struggle with that some. But it could mean several different things, could it? All right? So may I read to you what the New Revised Standard says on Psalm 51 and verse 5? The New Revised Standard says, Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. Y'all see what it does? It's saying what? You inherit sin, don't you? Because they thought that they had figured out what it meant and they were going to put it in the language that they thought best expressed that idea. So I've given you about three different examples there and I hope those are sufficient to make the point that you do have to exercise some caution, some care with your translations and not all of them are equal. Yes, Sister Kane? Yes, that's right. And we're going to have more discussion on the NIV later on. There are some difficulties, some challenges there, but we'll talk about that when we get to the NIV. Anybody have a thought or comment just on those points? Yes, Tom? So it it appears that that the translators were trying to, uh, if they, they believed in the doctrine of inherited <laughs> sin, and so they wanted that in there, that right. probably means that, that they were tended toward the once saved, always saved. Calvinistic and, in their exactly, their thinking, yes. and and that's what and that's what their end game was: is let's promote what we already believe as we translate this. Yes, I, I think you nailed it exactly. 
Calvinism is so strong in America today. I would guess, y'all can correct me if you think I'm wrong on this, but I would guess that in modern American religion, probably at least 90% of congregations embrace some form of Calvinism. And so it's not unusual or unthinkable that modern English translations would begin to reflect that viewpoint. And it's something that you have to be cautious about. I think Todd did a good job of explaining that. Anybody else have a thought or comment there just on those points that we're talking about? But yes, ma'am? The RSV, would they put only like in italics? Now, this is interesting because the RSV doesn't have the word only the, at all. The NRSV does insert the word only, and it's not in italics. It's just got only. Right? So that's kind of interesting. Okay, so far so good. I think we're doing a good job on this. And so, uh, as I said down here, how might translators slant these verses depending on their theological leanings? Well, I think Todd did a good job of explaining it. Todd, if I embrace faith only, or I embrace the idea that babies inherit sin, that they're born sinful, then I'm going to tend to translate any verses that deal with that subject in that direction, right? And so that's what we have to be cautious about. Anybody else? Yes, Bill. It sounded kind of a crazy comment, but do you think the Presbyterian and the denominational world would prefer the RSV? Yes, I do. Yes. On average, yes. Uh -huh. All right. So, so that's the Revised Standard Version. And now I want to talk to you a little bit about the New American Standard Bible, if I may. And uh, in Churches of Christ, it's been my experience lately about half the folks use New King James and about half use New American Standard. I'm curious this morning, how many of you are reading out of the New King James translation? All right? Uh, about half or a third, something like that. How many are reading out of the New American Standard Bible? All right? A little more, a few more there, okay? So uh, would it surprise you if I told you that the New American Standard Bible has dropped out of the top ten most popular Bibles in America today? Would it surprise you if I told you that? It has. The last couple of years, it's dropped out of the, the top ten. Why do you all think that it's dropped out of the top ten? Calvinism. Okay, but perhaps because of Calvinism, but also because of reading level. The New American Standard Bible is written on the 11th grade reading level. And the average reading level in America today is, what did we say? 7th grade. grade reading level. All right? And because of that, I think the New American Standard has begun to drop in popularity. And they are replacing it with a new translation that you probably haven't heard about. I'll tell you what it is. The Legacy Standard Bible. The Legacy Standard Bible. Lockman Foundation is, is using that to replace the New American Standard. And guess what the reading level has done? Seven. It's not seven, but they've dropped it down to ten anyway. <laughs> so it's a little easier to read. But I want to show you something that's unusual. I like the New American Standard, but the one thing that bothers me about it is it's gone through so many different editions. And so let me just show you some. Take a look, if y'all would, please, at Matthew 16, 19. And I know we're about out of time this morning. Y'all have been really good listeners. I appreciate that. Matthew 16, verse 19. This is, a, is an original New American Standard. This is a 1971 New American Standard that Brother Evan was holding. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you shall bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you shall loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. So the loosing took place in heaven first, and then the apostles teach it here on earth. That's 1971 New American Standard. Then Robin showed me a New American Standard that I bought for about, uh, oh, in the 80s, I think. And let me read it to you now. So this is the same verse, New American Standard, later edition. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, not shall have been bound, shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So they, they changed that verse back. Wait, I'm not finished yet. All right? <laughs> so now I have a later edition of the New American Standard from 1995, and I'm going to read the same verse to you. This is Matthew 16 and verse 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you shall bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed. You see what they did? 
They changed it one way, and then they changed it back again. And the one thing that bothers me about the New American Standard is all of the different editions. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it, that, that it goes through. And it's been updated again. There's a 2020 edition now. But anyway, just something for you to be aware of. All right. Okay, does anybody have any thoughts or closing comments on what we've talked about this morning? We've gone through some really good stuff. And what we're going to do is next week we're going to begin to talk about Bible prophecy. And I think I can show you that the God of the Bible is the God of the universe. And not only that, but that the Bible is his word. And that means that whatever time and effort you make in worshiping God is worth it. Your soul depends on it. I want you to go to heaven. Robin and I are going to be in heaven, and we want to see you there. And we're looking forward to that. And whatever time you spend in worshiping God is worth it. And I think I can show you that the Bible is indeed God's Word. Anybody have a closing comment or thought or question this morning? Uh, yes, Linda? I have a question, John. Yes, ma'am. I uh, didn't know that the gospel until after my son was born. Yes, ma'am. But growing up, I kind of sort of attended the Methodist church. Uh -huh. And I I remember having a friend uh, who was my age. I was probably 14, 15. And I had the King James Bible. Yes. That was what my dad had bought for me. And she said, she she showed me this Bible, and she said, you need to get this Bible. It's the it's the accurate one now because this man translated it so his daughter would understand. Do you know what? what yeah, was yes, ma'am, I do, and it's probably the least accurate Bible oh, out I, there. I, I That's the living so. Bible. I yeah, didn't, yes, that, that, I that didn't was, buy it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the story behind the living Bible, oh, okay. which is actually a paraphrased Bible. It's not even a translation oh, okay. properly. It's a paraphrased Bible. All right. So you're welcome to take a look at the chromosomes if you want to see what an entire set of chromosomes from a lady takes a look looks like up there. And I really appreciate everybody's kind comments this morning. All right. Good deal. Thank you.